The bareheaded birds would feed with less risk of illness, increasing their survival and their reproductive success. The message is clear. Feathers may be an evolutionary marvel for flight, for insulation, or for display, but they're worse than useless when you're neck deep inside a dead zebra. <laughs> so those vultures and their feathers, they got me thinking, what would make a bird lose something so inherent to its nature? And of course, in that case, it's their grisly, grisly feeding habits, providing a clear evolutionary process. Now, before I open up our evening tonight to your, to your questions, and I hope that you have them, I hope you have those burning feather questions that you must have answered before you could possibly rest this evening. Uh, but before I do that, I want to leave you with an image and a sound. Now, throughout the research for this book, I talked with a wide, a, range, a, a wide array of experts, and I asked many of them the same question. I asked them this. If we know that Archaeopteryx had modern-looking feathers 150 million years ago, then what's been happening in all that time? What's new in the world of feather evolution? And I got many intriguing answers, but my absolute favorite has to do with this character here. A small South American songbird whose oddly shaped wing feathers have puzzled and fascinated biologists for more than a century, ever since Darwin first wrote about these things in the 1870s. And only very recently has the mystery finally been solved. This video that I'm about to show you was shot in Ecuador's Milpe Cloud Forest Reserve by a photographer working with an extraordinary scientist, Kim Bostwick from Cornell, on an extraordinary subject, the club-winged mannequin, a bird that, for all intents and purposes, plays its feathers like a violin. And I can't think of any better way to conclude this portion of our evening than uh, with the dulcet tones of feather music. Feather music, ladies and gentlemen. There you have it. Thank you very, very much for your attention. And I would be very happy to answer questions. Yes, we've got one here. Um, I have been looking at the latest stealth airplanes and things like that with their delta shapes. Are there birds that adapt to that uh, aerodynamic shape? Great question. So do birds adapt to an aerodynamic shape like those airplanes? Um, there are many, many bird adaptations for aerodynamic purposes and the shapes of their bodies the, and the shapes of flight feathers themselves, even, even body feathers. So while you may not find that exact shape, you will find characteristics of birds on airplanes of various kinds. So if you look out the window next time you have the opportunity to soar through the skies in a plane, you'll see the shape of that wing is what they call an airfoil with a curved upper surface. And, and this enhances lift. It's not the only part of lift, but it enhances it, that airfoil shape. And if you look at a bird wing, it too is an airfoil with a curved upper surface. Same general shape. But what's amazing about a bird wing is that it is made up of individual airfoils because the flight feathers of a bird are also shaped like an airfoil with that same shape. And the bird has the ability to control movements of those flight feathers individually, constantly adjusting to any change in air speed or air pressure. Uh, so it's a really remarkable flight adaptation in birds in that they have an airfoil made of airfoils that allows them to, to take advantage of all kinds of aerodynamic possibilities. So you'll see that certainly in uh, planes. And engineers continue to learn from birds and from their feathers. The field of biomimicry, uh, you know, uh, modeling things off of things found in nature is, is very interested in bird feathers, uh, particularly now in terms of improving fuel efficiency for planes. 
Now, if you're on a jet sometime and you see it has a little uh, fin at the far end of the wing, uh, that was in part inspired by the way that soaring birds like vultures and rap or uh, the uh, buteo hawks and things spread their wingtips when they are soaring. And what they've learned is that by uh, disturbing uh, that area around the tip of a wing, you can influence patterns of turbulence that reduce drag on the wing. And so those, those little fins that you see were inspired in part from birds uh, and they increase the efficiency of the aircraft. So many, many other stories, but a great question. Yes, we continue to learn about aerodynamics from the birds. All the way in the back. So I had a question about one of the most interesting feathers and adaptations and sound and stuff is owl feathers. Did you talk about owl feathers at all? Mm. Yeah, oh, wonderful, yes. Yeah. So owl feathers, and in fact, on the way in here tonight, Gene had a, an owl feather to show me. They're, they're marvelous, marvelous things. And if you ever have the chance to touch an owl feather, what you will immediately notice is how soft that feather is. And owls have specially adapted the feathers uh, on uh, their outer contour feathers, but particularly on, on the wing, flight feathers and the contour feathers, the coverts there, uh, in that the feathers have a leading edge of extensions of the normal barbs that make up the vein of the feather. They also have extensions on uh, many of the uh, barbicels that connect the vein of that feather. And so, again, what that is doing is altering airflow over the surface of the wing. Instinctively, we would think that a smooth surface would have less drag, but that turns out not to be true. And a, a wonderful uh, example of that, if there are any Olympics sports fans in the, in the room, it, you may have noticed how in swimming several years ago at the Olympics, they were breaking all of the world records in swimming because they had developed new suits that mimicked shark skin. And instead of being smooth, they were roughened like the uh, scales of a shark. And what they had learned was that, in fact, a rough suit uh, covering the body would reduce drag. And that led to all of these great records. Well, the same thing is true in the air. And so what uh, owls have adapted to is roughening that surface of the feather to dampen sound. So their, feathers make al or their wings make almost no sound as they fly through the air. And they do it, of course, as an adaptation for their nocturnal hunting practices, where they are uh, using sound to locate prey and dive down upon it uh, without scaring it away. So it has a dual purpose there. Uh, it's a wonderful adaptation. And a great evolutionary story in that if you look across the world of owls, you can find a few examples of where they don't have that adaptation. For example, the Scops fishing owl, an African owl that specializes in catching fish. And it becomes quickly clear as you think about it that a fish can't hear you coming. <laughs> so why bother with the, the, the sound proofing? Uh, and so the Scops fishing owl, uh, when it flaps its wings, it's as loud as a raven or a crow because they don't have those special uh, adaptations. Great question about owl feathers. Yes, right next door. Uh, talk about silence and flight. Uh, I've been out in the yard. We live over in Lincolnshire. Um, and I uh, standing in the yard one day and heard this rush of air. She had a rocket. And looking around, and I finally looked up, an eagle in hot pursuit of another eagle was flying by the house. That's a, it's a great observation how loud a bird's wings can be. They really can be loud. And that is a wonderful, you know, when you have a large bird uh, going fast in that way, they can be quite loud. And that is uh, part of what makes the owl's adaptation. Many owls are large and their silence really incredible. But of course, for, for eagles, there is not necessarily any evolutionary pressure pointing in that direction because they don't rely on that kind of stealth for their uh, diet. And so you see it in, you see it in owls and birds uh, that, uh, that hunt by night, typically. Yeah. Great observation, though. And another thing that they are learning about, uh, or, or experimenting with, I should say, in biomimicry, is trying to make airplane wings quieter, uh, which would influence the availability of, of takeoff and landing windows at, at major airports, where they're concerned about sound. Yeah. Here in the middle. That's evident at night in summertime when you hear the nighthawks dive and swoop. It's a very audible sound. 
Yeah. Is that a meaning ritual? Is that just when they're playing? Or what seems to be the phenomenon of that? The question is about night hawks and the wonderful sounds that you hear late summer evenings when the night hawks are displaying. And it is a mating display. And it's the male night hawks that do it, swooping and uh, vib It's actually a feather noise that you hear at the bottom of the swoop. Uh, and it's made by movement of air through specially adapted feathers that vibrate and resonate. So a wonderful example of adaptation specifically for sound to attract mates in the way that we saw this mannequin uh, uh, using sound to attract a mate. That was a male bird where uh, instead of simply vibrating uh, feathers, it's even more complex in that the secondary feathers are adapted, and they call it the club wing because of the club shape of these feathers. The uh, shaft or quill part of one of the feathers is enlarged, oddly, and if you look up farther on that fe feather, there are a row of uh, ridges on the rachis. The neighboring feather has a, a hook, a little pick, and so the bird shoves his wings up behind him, vibrates them together so that the picks of those uh, feathers rub across the ridges very rapidly, and the, uh, then the enlarged quill of that feather resonates just like the body of a stringed instrument. Uh, so there are many uh, subtle adaptations that birds have come up with for sound with feathers. Great question. Now right in the front. Is the amount of feathers that a bird has any way forecast what the weather is going to be? Oh, does the amount of feathers a bird uh, has, is it, can you forecast the weather by it? Well, it will tell you when winter is coming but it won't tell you how bad the winter is going to be. <laughs> but it will definitely tell you when winter is coming yeah. in that um, uh, pre-winter molts uh, generally, particularly for temperate and, and higher uh, birds, uh, include a lot more down than the summer coat. Very, very evident that uh, they're bulking up on uh, downy, insulative feathers for the winter. Yeah, good question. Yes, in the middle. Has there been any Mm, genetic sequencing for, you know, there's a lot of genetic work being done on birds, but I'm not aware yet of any full genome that's been, uh, that's been completed where they've actually identified uh, all of those, you know, feather genes and started to compare them. So I don't have a specific answer to that. I'm sure people are working on that very question because you're getting to the point now with the genetic tools where you have the power to start looking at those individual traits and linking uh, you know, traits that are under selective pressure, as feathers certainly are, uh, to different evolutionary uh, scenarios and, and habitat types. So I, I would expect that that thing is going on, but I don't know specifically. Good question, Scott. Yes? I had a couple of hummingbird questions. The first one is those deep dives that they do, are those courting displays? Yes, so here's a marvelous, another marvelous example of not only a fabulous mating display, but there's an example that gives you all kinds of feathery things to look at. And that if you watch that male ruby-throated hummingbird, and other species do it too, but uh, around here, uh, or the rufous uh, hummingbird, I should say, uh, is the one that you'd be looking for to do this. Uh, the male will dive down, and then at the bottom of that dive, you'll hear that and that is, again, feathers in the tail being used to vibrate to make an attractive sound. That's a deliberate sound. Deliberate sound. And when they then stop, they uh, raise the, the, the feathers here that are iridescent. And so that gives you a wonderful example of iridescent structural colors in feathers. Yeah, yeah, so <laughs> absolutely. The other question was, um, I'm very fortunate in that I have several hummingbirds feeding right outside my window, so I get a close look. And I have watched uh, it, it, I mean, it is an amazing adaptation, but it's, you know, they're, they're adapted to do it. The muscles are there, the bone structure is there, and that keeps them hovering. You know, the, it's an incredible suite of characters that allow them to fly in that way. Uh, and again, you know, people, there are a lot of new tools in biology that are allowing people to study these things, and, and specifically, uh, uh, video that is digital and you know very high speed 
so that they can slow down things like that to the point where they can actually see what's going on. So a lot is being learned about those kinds of flight things, about things like that club-winged mannequin when it's hammering its wings together so fast you have to slow it down you know, to like a thousand uh, frames per second to be able to see the action of the pick across the ridges and things like that. So it's, it's a wonderful suite of characters and we're still learning about it. Yeah. Uh, okay, here. Yeah. Iridescence. Ah, how much time do you have? Mm. <laughs> Wonderful structural coloration. So you have two major ways that uh, feathers are colored. They are colored through pigments, which we're all familiar with. Your blue jeans or whatever you're wearing are, are most likely uh, colored with pigments. And pigments work by absorbing a certain amount of the spectrum and reflecting a certain amount back to us. If uh, everything is reflected, we perceive it as white. If it's all absorbed in the pigment, then we perceive it as black, and all the colors are gradations in between. But there's another way to make color without pigments, and that's simply through the structure uh, that is at the surface of a feather or just inside that surface layer. And structural colors are generally made, well, in a variety of ways, but by the diffraction of light. And so the light strikes that surface and is scattered in an organized fashion. So that you, uh, looking at that feather, if you are aligned with those wavelengths, you perceive a color. And as you move back and forth, you can perceive a shimmer. So the iridescence that you see is your perspective changing to the uh, scattering of light coming off the surface of that feather. And the things often work in concert, so that you will have structural colors combined with pigmentary colors uh, to dazzle the eye. If you are familiar, I know we have uh, someone in here with a parrot. Yes, and the, green, the greens, the shimmering greens on many parrot species are in fact a combination of structural and pigmentary colors. A uh, pigment-based yellow and a structurally-based blue. So what we see when we look at the parrot is a shimmering green. Oh, yeah, sorry. 